Well, welcome friends to part two of strangulation, what we learned in 2019 and in the 1900s and 2000s and our entire life. Uh, this is uh, Casey Gwynn, the president of Alliance for Hope International. We're very honored to have you joining us for part two. Hopefully you were able to listen to part one. I am of course joined by the founder of the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, Gail Strack, who's also the CEO of Alliance for Hope International. Uh, we are also joined in part two by Dr. Bill Smock, Lieutenant Dan Rincon, and Diana Fogno. We're very honored to have them representing what is almost 100 now faculty members uh, and advisory board members who are involved in a variety of ways with the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention at Alliance for Hope International. Uh, part one really focused on context and the things that we need to understand before we get into the nitty gritty. You don't want to tell people to pay attention and work hard on near and non-fatal strangulation cases if you don't tell them the why of what they're doing first, because the why uh, will sustain them in this work uh, in every discipline represented here. We want to particularly thank the Office on Violence Against Women, uh, Laura Rogers, the acting director, and Kevin Sweeney, our program manager, uh, for supporting us uh, in this journey. Uh, we talked a little bit more about that in part one, uh, but we appreciate their support. And we will now uh, dive into part two uh, of this uh, presentation. And part two will go deeper. Uh, Gail Strack, we've asked to talk a little bit as we begin about the law. Uh, and then we're going to dive into uh, the investigation piece, the medical piece. And uh, Diana's going to do a little bit on pediatrics as well. So welcome to part two of strangulation, what we have learned in 2019. Well, thank you, Casey, and it's great to be here with all of you, so thank you for joining us. I really like starting off with the law in part two. The law is really critical because it was one of the reasons why we failed victims in San Diego. Back then, we had zero statutes in 1995 that even included the word strangulation, and now I'm happy to report we've got some success. So congratulations to all of you who have passed some form of a felony strangulation and or suffocation law. We keep track of those laws on our website. As we mentioned before, we have a legislation or legislative map that we keep track of those statutes. And we're also going to be going in a deeper dive to analyze those statutes like statute by statute and make some additional recommendations. I'm happy to report that uh, the military has included strangulation and suffocation into their uh, uniform Code of Military Justice, I call it Dean's Law. I call it Dean's Law because Dr. Dean Hawley was one of our original medical faculty and advisors, and for years he tried to incorporate this into the Military Code, and this year it became effective. Uh, what's interesting about that code is just, it just added the words, but it didn't define it. So for those of you who are here from, with uh, the military, you're going to have to take a good look at how it's defined in the federal code, 18 U.S.C. 113. There you'll see strangulation and suffocation defined. And for those states that don't include a definition, I would suggest to you go to this one. It's a really good definition that has really guided the feds as they've been going forward. Uh, the other one that I like to remind folks about is the federal sentencing guidelines. And the reason I like the federal sentencing guideline that Dean explained to us is that when the feds pass a new law, they have to have a hearing. And in that hearing, they take expert testimony, trial briefs, and all sorts of information to try to guide judges what to do with this new statute called strangulation and suffocation. What is the appropriate punishment? And I'm happy to say that after everybody submitted their letters of support, their comments, their trial briefs, their testimony, the recommendation was for 10, up to 10 years. It's a good document for prosecutors from a state that you just passed your strangulation law. One of the challenges you're going to have is to get judges to understand how important this is and how serious it's going to be. So that's one thing we wanted to remind folks. As we mentioned in part one, this particular webinar is for those people who have gone to our trainings before, and it can serve both as a refresher course on some key points, and then also give you an update in some core areas. The other thing we wanted to point out is, as we've been getting questions as to who has passed the strangulation or suffocation law, which ones are your favorites, who hasn't? So I just want to 
not to shame anyone, this is just factual, that we still have work to do in DC, American Samoa, Guam, um, the islands, Puerto Rico, and, and uh, so let's, let's do that. Let's do this this year, 2019. I do, 2020. Want to, I do want to mention, even as you're saying that, and as we're, uh, we're broadcasting, uh, that Washington, D.C. Uh, has introduced a felony uh, statute for strangulation. Um, and it is not passed, but it is pending. So uh, Washington, D.C. is moving down that road. And obviously, uh, we would like to see this uh, happen uh, around the country and around the, around the world, and certainly in uh, American territories. And speaking of who else can improve their codes, I just want to thank and acknowledge Leslie Hagan. Uh, she's an amazing friend, leader, former prosecutor, and really is leading the way when it comes to addressing strangulation, suffocation among um, Native women in an Indian country. So we have the great fortune and honor to be able to train with her usually once a year in November at the National Advocacy Center. And I'm happy to share that we are now at class number seven. So here's our last group photo. And what we are finding is that the people who attend our advanced course are the change agents. They are the ones that are taking this information and doing something about it. So by our last count, we believe we have at least 20 tribal codes that have amended their statutes to include strangulation and suffocation. So thank you very much for your leadership because it really matters. The other thing we wanted to kind of highlight, and thanks Casey for telling me about DC, um, we have Kentucky. So Dr. Bill Smock is on the call. So Dr. Bill Smock, thank you for bringing a team of folks together. I know your prosecutor association did a lot of work, but what I like about your new strangulation law is there's also a little piece that maybe folks don't appreciate, but there's a section there about training police officers in gathering evidence for medical exam. It doesn't say uh, GP exams are gonna be for free, but I think it's a good first step that uh, is gonna play an important role as we go into the future. Bill, did you just wanna make a comment on that? Yes, it was a, a, a tough, Road to, road to hoe to get us there. We tried many times over the years to get our felony statute, but finally we were able to push it through, and not only with a Class D felony, but also a Class C felony, which is uh, up to 10 years, which I'm very proud of the work that was done by all the people in Kentucky to get this on the books after years of trying. And I think we're trying to play catch up. We know that we've been in Kentucky behind the curve, and prosecutors now believe that if they have the tools and the statutes, they can hold these individuals accountable, and they are doing so. We're seeing the principal indictment is the Class C felony, which is the five to 10 year felony. And so I'm very proud of the work that uh, is currently being done uh, by our prosecutors. That's great. And with respect to other states that are either um, improving their strangulation law or adding one, Alaska uh, went back to the legislature to include strangulation to the point of loss of consciousness, making that a first degree assault. And also a very high profile case from Alaska where a woman was strangled to unconsciousness. And when she woke up, she saw him ejaculate on her. And it wasn't taken very seriously because it wasn't defined in their statute as sexual assault. So they fixed it. So good for Alaska for doing that. And the judge lost his job. They took the judge, the judge lost his election. So that, that, that was a good statement about the community standing up and saying, you don't get to treat strangulation of survivors and sexual assault survivors this way, your honor. Uh, and the judge was removed from the bench. And I think it was also a good statement from the community because there was an outrage on how this case was poorly handled. So our voices do matter. And that was my big takeaway when I saw all of that media attention on this particular case, because it really was outrageous. The other one that I want to give a shout out to is Hawaii. Hawaii recently updated their strangulation law to include ligature and also pressure to the chest, which is something that many of the original strangulation suffocation statutes miss because we were focused on the neck, the nose and the mouth, and we did not include chest or torso. I do want to just provide a clarification. We are big fans of adding the chest, but uh, Bill, can you just make a comment about this? Because I mean, essentially we're changing the medical and kind of physiology of this by calling that strangulation. But can you just yeah. talk about what that yeah. is 
it's important to include, but it's obviously uh, we're, we're creating almost a legal fiction in some of these states. Yes, and under the big umbrella of asphyxia, that just means depriving the human tissue of oxygen. And there are lots of ways to do that. It can be from carbon monoxide poison, poisoning, but in this case, it could be a pressure applied to the face, to the neck, or pressure applied to the chest. Because if you restrict the ability to respire, you are creating a hypoxic situation where your oxygen levels go down, your CO2 goes up, and then you've created eventually an anoxic situation. And you can just as easily kill somebody or cause brain damage by preventing their ability to breathe. Good. So an important piece to include, but just be aware that, you know, as we're, if we're adding these to statutes, it's not actually strangulation in the sense that somebody is providing external pressure to the neck. But it's, uh, but it's asphyxia, and it's obviously uh, a version of uh, suffocation in a way, uh, the inability to uh, do the bellows motion, the inability to lift your chest to breathe. Um, so it's an important piece, but obviously something that we need to make sure that we articulate well uh, the difference between the medical physiology and the law. So Dr. Bill Smock, would you agree with our legal and medical interpretation that pressure applied to the chest is a form of suffocation? Absolutely. It's a form of asphyxia. And again, you think of that big umbrella of asphyxia, strangulation is asphyxia, suffocation is asphyxia, positional asphyxia is asphyxia. It all has the same end effect of depriving the tissue of oxygen, and then the brain is the most sensitive organ in the entire body, and that's what dies first, and that's why people have brain damage when they are deprived of oxygen. Perfect. So thank you both Casey and Bill for clarifying that, because this does come up as an area of confusion. So the last one was Maine, and there's actually a few more in a different area. But Maine uh, worked very hard by Kentucky to try to pass a strangulation suffocation law. Sometimes it's not so easy to do in your community and you have to negotiate and sometimes settle for something is better than nothing. However, um, if it's not working, it's also equally important to go back to your legislature and improve it. And that's exactly what Maine did. They went back to improve the definition of strangulation and also to clarify the intent to make it easier for them to prosecute these cases. And we have seen some fuzzy laws around the country where prosecutors struggle because the law was written in such a way that it almost looks like it's a specific intent crime uh, to, uh, to prosecute somebody for felony strangulation. And the reality is that this should be a general intent crime. You simply have the general intent to do an act that ends up applying pressure to the neck that blocks airflow or blood flow. You don't have to know you're blocking airflow or blood flow. You don't have to intend to block airflow or blood flow. It's why we love the federal definition where you saw not only that it's a general intent crime, but recklessness is included, almost a depraved heart kind of an approach that you can recklessly do this. You don't even have to intend to do it. Uh, so we we definitely are encouraging people to update their statutes to make very clear across the board this is this is not specific intent. We don't expect stranglers to know exactly the physiology of what they're doing, or for prosecutors to have to prove what's going on in the mind of a strangler. So the next piece we wanted to talk about is some favorite statutes. So what we're finding is if your state is mobilized and engaged and you're ready to take that next step to improve it, please give us a call. We can tell you some of our favorite statutes and things that we're thinking about even today. But one of the favorites that I want to highlight due to time is what California passed and also Virginia. Virginia passed a no bail a presumption law. So if you are strangled and you get arrested or the abuser gets arrested, people have recognized, as we pointed out in part one, that the stranglers are different and they are dangerous. They pose a threat not only to the victim, but to the general public and police officers. So they went and took that step to make it a no bail presumption when it comes to strangulation. We will see how this plays itself out in light of all of the jail and bail reform. The other like top favorite is our California law, which I call the duty to warn and duty to track law. In this particular law, it, it mandates police officers who respond to a domestic violence call, they find out a victim has been strangled or suffocated, they have a duty to warn her about how serious this can be 
how it can cause internal injuries and encourage her to seek immediate medical attention. We've also added talking to an advocate because victims who are strangled are at high risk and they really do need safety planning. The other important piece is the duty to track. So in California, our police officers are changing their forms, they're tracking the stranglers in the hopes of keeping our police officers alive and safe. So they, when, when they respond to a DV call and they do their search as to the history, they hopefully can find out the history of strangulation, just like you would know if someone is the subject to a restraining order or has a gun or is known to carry a gun or threaten police officers or others. So the duty to warn is important. And I would say in your state, if you haven't uh, considered this, I don't think you need a law to do this. I think it's almost an ethical duty, especially after you've received training, to start warning victims about the danger of strangulation, immediate, delayed, and long term. Casey, I wanted you to talk about the DV exam because we're seeing some new statutes. This is a very uh, significant area for us. It has been for a very long time, and we just want to touch on it. We feel and have felt very strongly for years that we need to address uh, legally this issue of the responsibility of professionals to provide access to a medical forensic exam for victims of domestic violence strangulation in particular. Obviously, sexual assault victims do have access to a sexual assault examination. Uh, and forensic nurses uh, provide those at no cost to the victim. Uh, we do not yet have that uh, on a national level or in virtually any state in America either. So this is a very important piece uh, for us. There is beginning to be some movement. We're talking to legislators in California about trying to take this on at the state level. The state of Washington has introduced a bill uh, to uh, provide both funding and, uh, and a process for uh, domestic violence uh, forensic exam, particularly focused on strangulation assault. Uh, we advocated for this with the National Task Force that has been involved in uh, passing the Violence Against Women Act and in ultimately doing um, updates to the Violence Against Women Act every five years. Uh, they did not feel this was the time uh, to include this, but this is a very important piece. If we're gonna talk about victims being uh, transported to hospitals, calling 911, having EMS come to the scene, as we'll talk about in this webinar, and then getting paramedics to transport victims. We do not want victims to end up with massive bills when they show up at a hospital. They are victims of felonious crimes, often near fatal crimes that are on the edge of a murder, and we do not want them to be getting uh, massive bills for not only a forensic exam, but ultimately, potentially, the neurological assessment and treatment that to happen after that. So this is an issue that's going to be talked about both in your states uh, and, and uh, at the federal level over the next couple of years. We are seeing movement, which we're encouraged by. Uh, the Office on Violence Against Women uh, currently has a RFP out uh, that is looking to develop a national protocol for forensic medical exams uh, in domestic violence and strangulation assaults, and we're obviously very supportive of that process. Let's get a national protocol then let's figure out how to train, implement it, and then how to fund it, uh, which is ultimately going to be where the rubber meets the road uh, for survivors. There are a few states uh, I've mentioned here that are, in fact, looking at this or working on it or have pending bills. If you know of other states that have bills pending about funding or providing access to uh, domestic violence forensic exams, we'd love to uh, know about it. Um, and be involved in it. There are a few jurisdictions that are providing it without cost to the victim, Maricopa County, Arizona, which Dan will touch on, certainly was one of the first leaders in this, first using asset forfeiture money and now using general fund revenue. Washington, D.C. has created a general fund funding stream for domestic violence examinations and a few other jurisdictions, both tribal and civilian jurisdictions around the country, but we have a long, long, long ways to go. The military is now pushing forward on this for providing forensic exams for domestic violence and strangulation assault victims as well. Uh, but we just wanted to highlight that issue. It's an important one. And I wanted to come back to the nice strategy from Kentucky. So Bill, did you have anything to do with this one? I have a suspicion that you did, but kind of like way below after the law was included, there was a section about training for police officers, which you can see here what I highlighted, including screening and forensic evidence collection for strangulation. So if you have the insights, we would love to hear about it. 
<laughs> oh, I wish I could claim credit. Uh, we've been in doing uh, training of our um, every one of our recruits for the last I don't know, 10 years has received two hours of strangulation training as part of their basic academy. But um, I did not play any role in this, but I'm so glad to see it's included. And so I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention because I think it's a good strategy because training, training, training is key. And if our police officers get trained on why this is important, we're going to be able to do a better job to communicate that to victims. And uh, Lieutenant Dan Rincon will talk about some of the uh, exams and some of the challenges and how they did a really good job of improving victims wanting to get those exams. So overall, we wanted you to kind of focus on here's our list for 2020 what we can pay a little more attention to. Areas that need amendments or adjustments to laws. Yes, and how we can sprinkle just the word strangulation into a bail statute or to an enhancement statute. Or if you already have legislation about sexual assault, I always say, let's just add three little words. No victim of sexual assault or domestic violence shall have to pay for domestic for a forensic exam. Medical mandated reporting is another area, only one state, and that was North Carolina, that specifically called out strangulation because of its lethality risk as something that should be reported. And then primary aggressor, as I mentioned in part one, we are seeing victims that are being arrested for domestic violence, just trying to defend themselves from being strangled. Take a look at another easy way of improving your response is by improving the definition of what is great bodily injury, serious bodily injury, traumatic condition. Every state has a different term. Pregnancy, a couple of states have passed strangulation laws to include the pregnant victim. And I would say training, training, training. So Casey? One of the biggest challenges and we've seen this last year is as these laws have been getting passed across the country, uh, is nobody has an implementation plan in place. Uh, when we added strangulation and suffocation to California Penal Code Section 273.5, our spousal abuse statute, uh, which we were uh, happy to lead the effort on legislatively in California, uh, Gail and I did 17 trainings across the state after we passed that statute. Um, and we organized them. Uh, they were all hosted, virtually all of them, in family justice centers across the state. So we already had multidisciplinary teams uh, working in those communities, and that has to happen across the country. And if you haven't had implementation planning and an implementation process in your state, even if your law passed two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, you need to do that because the reality is that uh, your officers, uh, your prosecutors are going to fail over and over and over again uh, if you haven't actually done the implementation around the law. So Gail put in a few ideas here that we have seen implemented in 2019 uh, after legislation has passed. Obviously, some kind of state team looking at it, some kind of local strangulation assault task force or domestic violence and strangulation assault task force. Uh, obviously, training uh, what Bill just touched on, pushing it into the academy, regimenting it into every police academy in your state. Uh, so that everybody coming through the academy is learning about strangulation, both context and substance. Uh, obviously, uh, training and focusing on what prosecutors argue at bail hearings or um, at pretrial hearings in general. There's a few states now that are eliminating bail altogether, New York and California and a few others. Uh, and of course, they're finding that that's uh, backlashing on them because without the ability to set bail, uh, judges are reluctant to let people out of jail uh, without bail, period. So it's actually having the opposite effect that a lot of our bail reform folks thought it was going to have. But you've got to get into those hearings, whether bail is being set or not, and educate judges that these stranglers are different uh, than other kinds of offenders. So we gave you a few examples there, a written protocol. San Diego has one of the leading protocols in America now on handling strangulation cases. And now our health and human services folks are doing a public awareness campaign with posters and billboards around it. There's lots of ways to do uh, implementation. At the local level, there are some examples developing. Ken Shedder, who is the mayor of Burleson, Texas, and is also the president of the Safe City uh, uh, Commission's One Safe Place, the Family Justice Center for with Texas, uh, passed a local statute mandating EMS response and creating a task force in order to address this. That can be done by any city in America. And Bur 
Carlson has a model statute that can be adopted in any city or county across the country. Uh, but without a doubt, protocols, protocols, protocols. And if you don't have a written protocol, you can't expect everybody to be doing the same thing. You can't expect everybody to be on the same sheet of music. So in 2020, that should be the goal of every jurisdiction in America, uh, that you at least have a local protocol to say who does what, what's the role of EMS, what's the role of 911, and obviously our institute is available to support you all. We're very honored to uh, have Lieutenant Dan Rincon from Scottsdale Police Department in Maricopa County, Arizona with us. Maricopa County has led the way in this. We have been so honored to align ourselves with the work of Maricopa County going back many years with Jill Rabel and Dan and a whole bunch of committed folks there. Um, so Dan, welcome. It's great to have uh, you join us today and talk a little bit about the journey in Maricopa County. You bet. Good day, everyone. Uh, you know, Casey, thanks for that lead in because, you know, when you were talking about, you know, the planning and, and more so the implementation of, of, a, of a law and a program, uh, that implementation piece is, is vital. In fact, our failure in that in the beginning led to the, our model that we um, currently have. When our law was written and in implemented in uh, Jan uh, July of 2010, it was exactly that. They put it on the books and that was it. No training to prosecutors, no training to law enforcement. It was actually very small individual efforts around the state that people were just trying to train their cops and, and uh, prosecutors had not received anything uh, for the first year and a half. And when the county attorney, the uh, Honor Healthcare with uh, uh, Karen Rasil, uh, Jill Rabel, uh, myself uh, and, and uh, the attorneys at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office created this plan, a pilot project, six month pilot project that incorporated two major changes. Number one was the implementation of training and uh, repeated training throughout to law enforcement officers that uh, were working these cases and detectives. The second piece was also introducing the forensic nurse exam that our victims would be able to receive at no cost. And what it allowed us to do is to gain uh, uh, forensic evidence that we were not able to get otherwise. Uh, and when we looked at that, that county protocol, when we took two individual cities, was the city of Chandler and the city of Glendale, Arizona, their filing rates were very low, 14%. And within less than a six month period, increased to 61%, which is extremely significant. As you said, we were using RICO funds to support this. It was, not, it was a very easy sell to get it on the general fund. I would actually like to add also, we're talking about the laws. I had the pleasure of talking with uh, Senator Victoria Steele here in Arizona just a, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, myself and Sergeant uh, Brian Knight with the uh, Tucson Police Department. And one of the things that we're actually giving it a shot at, and they have it in appropriations right now, is to have every forensic exam in Arizona paid for. So it takes it even out of the hands of Maricopa County that it's going to be paid for by the state. Uh, how it will go, we don't know, but it's pretty exciting uh, that, that it's even uh, uh, in consideration to do that. And again, also changing the language of our laws to including pressure on the chest. Uh, getting back to our model, uh, as you can see, our model was uh, implemented fully in Maricopa County in, uh, in July of 2012. And as you can see from the slide, we started that year with 139 domestic violence homicides. That includes uh, offenders who also killed themselves. Uh, as you can see throughout the last several years, from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way up to now, uh, the, the numbers have fallen. In fact, actually, this year was the first year. Uh, we, I just actually obtained the numbers for 2019, and it was 89. So it's the first year in uh, what looks like over seven, eight years that we had a very, almost in, uh, very light increase of, of three cases. Uh, but at the end of the day, you see that progression, and it's because we're getting them in. It's homicide prevention. That's exactly what this is, because if it's the last warning shot and we'll be able to do something when we see that, it's that ability to do something that's going to change lives and save lives. Uh, and we couldn't be more proud of this uh, protocol. That's great, Dan. We'll, and we'll come back to you here uh, in just a minute. But I think if you... Um 
you're listening to this and you want to get some resources, uh, the modeling what Maricopa County did uh, is certainly great. Uh, San Diego County, in many ways, uh, has just taken all of our work and done and taken some of the work from Maricopa County and kind of re-upped everything that we were doing and learned 15, 18, 20 years ago into a countywide protocol. And we too are seeing that continued drop in domestic violence homicides countywide. If you go after the stranglers, as Dan said, you're definitely doing homicide prevention work. The other thing I just wanted to give a shout out for is uh, this whole notion of billboards. We saw some of this in Arizona uh, as well, but we love this idea of raising public awareness. On, when you're raising public awareness on domestic violence and strangulation, you're raising public awareness for your jury pools. You're raising public awareness for your judges. You're ways raising public awareness for everybody in the community, including offenders and perpetrators. So uh, without a doubt, protocol is important. Public outreach is important. The training piece is important. Uh, as Dan talked about, the forensic exams are crucial. Uh, you really are at a terrible disadvantage in prosecuting these cases if you don't have forensic nurses involved and a forensic exam involved. And we've seen uh, the same dramatic increase uh, in felony prosecutions and felony convictions in San Diego uh, that Maricopa County has seen uh, because of the implementation of a protocol. Tulsa's also seen the same thing, haven't they, Gail? They have, and it's interesting. I think the Tulsa initiative is really a story of individual people bringing other people together. So at the Tulsa Family Justice Center, they immediately started with a forensic unit and Kathy Bell as an on-site nurse part-time. And I think now she's up to full-time. Then the next piece is uh, getting all of your partners on board. And it was one detective who Casey saw your training and said, I can do something. Because we do challenge people at our training to take this information and do something with it. You will see some results as a result of public awareness, education, training police officers, essentially what they call their Tulsa Strangulation Initiative. They started to see more reports, more exams. And if you go to the next slide, you're going to see also the homicide rate drop. Uh, I ran out of time, so I wasn't able to call Suzanne to find out what is their statistics for 2019. But the last email that I had, she was predicting, uh, again, another year with less domestic violence homicides. Well, and this is an important piece because both Tulsa and Oklahoma City have implemented aggressive approaches on near and non-fatal strangulation. And as a result of the homicide drops, domestic violence homicide drops in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma has dramatically moved out of the top 10 of states in America where women are murdered. Oklahoma has been in the top five for years and years and years. And because of this reduction in homicides, Oklahoma has actually moved out of the top 10, which is an amazing statement about the focus on stranglers and how it can save the lives of women uh, across the board. So we always talk about that one detective, that one uh, nurse, that one advocate, that one FAC director, that one prosecutor that can make a difference. Now, I think, Dan, you wanted to talk about this piece because this year we saw two uh, articles essentially come out about the law enforcement response and multidisciplinary team. And Brevard County in particular, I'll go to the next slide, Casey, is an area where they wanted to model the Maricopa model and brought our whole team in where we had a chance to work with researchers at their local university look at the forensic medical exam and the training aspect uh regarding brevard county uh, I, I was blessed to be a part of the team that went out there uh one of the things that i immediately noted actually all of us noted it, it wasn't just a buy-in from one entity it, it was a clear-cut buy uh, regarding brevard county from, uh, I, I was blessed to be a part of the team that went out there uh, one of the things uh, from the academic I immediately world, noted actually all uh, of us noted crime scene it wasn't just a buy when they went into this they went in this with the it, right it was way a clear cut in all their partners not just one agency uh but multiple agencies to do this and uh with this article what it really showed uh on, on the findings and this article was uh uh, published in July of, of uh, 2019, so six months ago, is 
Uh, the strangulation, uh, strang the strangulation training improved law enforcement identification and documentation of strangulation and related injuries. Uh, a formal complaint by law enforcement was submitted 100% of cases when uh, when there was forensic evidence. And if you're using a forensic uh, nurse, that that it definitely uh, increases your uh, chances of finding that evidence greatly. 70.8% uh, of those cases had forensic evidence and had uh, sufficient evidence for prosecutors to move forward, uh, which was 46.6% um, higher than before they uh, started with their initiative. Uh, strangulation cases uh, with forensic evidence were more likely to be charged than strangulation uh, with their, uh, as a felony than it, uh, as a misdemeanor. And one thing that actually on uh, the findings of this, which wasn't so much positive, but it was something we experienced here in Maricopa County, was only 17%, 17.5% of the non-fatal strangulation victims consented to an exam. And what I'd like to share out there is it was something as simple as this. When we looked into that, sometimes officers don't, they, they forget about the caring part. We all care, but we always look into the investigation. And when they were presenting this to our victims, they were saying, Things like, hey, we'd like to be able to get more evidence to help us uh, prosecute this crime. When what we should have been doing is just going back to what we do on any traffic accident or any time anyone's injured. Are you okay? Yeah. This is this is this is this can be fatal. This can have lasting injuries. We want you to get help. We want to be able to do this. It's no charge to you. We urge you to do this. And when that approach was changed, that low percentage skyrocketed right up on just on how we approached our victims. Well, and Dan, in Maricopa, your your transport rate uh, for forensic medical exam is dramatically higher than 17%, right? Oh, yes, it's, uh, it is, it is um, I'd argue it's it's well above 80%. Yeah, I think the last time uh, Jill trained for us, I think she said it's pushing 85%, uh, which is uh, obviously gonna make a huge difference for survivors to be properly assessed if you can get them from the scene uh, to a uh, forensic nurse. Yes, that, that, that change is something we found during our um, pilot project as to why are, are, why are they not going? And then we realized that a little bit further training need to be done as how we approach our victims. And that really changed it all. Well, this study is available to all of you uh, and is certainly a great resource for you. Um, and we won't uh, belabor all of these uh, kind of findings and recommendations. It's pretty much everything that we've been saying uh, on this webinar on part one and on part two and the incredible importance of the forensic medical exam uh, in this process and the use of forensic nurses. Dan, you want to talk a little bit about the Austin study? Yeah, the Austin study was in, uh, came out in 2018. It was by the intimate partner. It was uh, the intimate partner violence uh, strangulation officer training and supplemental strangulation form being used. I was done by the Crime Victims Institute at the uh, Criminal Justice Center of Sam Houston uh, State University in Texas. Uh, some of the things that stood out on this is, you know, uh, Travis County is, is larger than just Austin. And uh, it appears that just the findings of Austin were there. That kind of is an indicator that were other police departments really involved. So when we talk about that holistic approach of bringing in everybody, not just isolated uh, areas, uh, how well it can work or not work. And it goes right back to that implementation piece. I, I would uh, also, I also noted that in some of the things that towards the end, and I would really urge people to read this uh, to formulate their own uh, opinion about this study. But one thing that was clear is the data collected was uh, uh, quote, a convenience sample, which basically means they didn't have, the researchers, the people that are getting this information really didn't have full access. And that can be problematic uh, in those things. But what they found were that the use of, uh, of the strangulation supplement form and training of officers, both uh, their studies before and after doing that, uh, really showed no difference, which was um, very interesting to say the least. But you go back to the training, which we were just talking about. Uh, they had initial training in the academy and then one training to the police department that were out of the academy. And when you talk about training, it is that one slide from about two slides ago, I remember seeing train, train, train. And, and, and you really, that, that has to be hit so hard because, you know, 
in the academy, it lets a new officer say, no, that, hey, you know what, this stuff is important. I remember something from the academy. You know, I was just trying to survive, but I remember something from the academy. And then when you have that biannual, you know, annual or, or semi-annual training regarding this, a refresh or even briefing trainings, what it does is it, it makes a, 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 uh, an event that's not as frequent more frequent so that when it happens, you're prepared. It's just like a child abduction. We don't get them every day, but when you get them, you can't mess them up. This is no different. Yeah. And uh, that, that's that the study on this, that's really what it showed is, was there a lack of partnerships? Was there a lack of collaboration with all the entities that family justice centers, family advocacy centers really embrace and talk about? And, and, and I think that's the difference maker in a lot of these things. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, and I, I think the uh, Austin study is helpful in the sense that just a form doesn't do anything for you. Uh, and just saying, oh, you know, use this form and then send the cases to the prosecutor's office isn't going to produce better results. Particularly exactly. prosecutors uh, aren't winning these cases in court, which they were not. So this dynamic is an important one because I can't overemphasize what you just said. Arizona's got this benefit of the Family Advocacy Center framework. It's government agencies mostly, but very much like a Family Justice Center framework. Oklahoma, Tulsa, and OKC have the benefit of that Family Justice Center multi-agency framework. Most of the communities with major drops, they're doing all these things. They're not just creating a form uh, and then putting it out and saying, use this and everything will get better. And if you don't have that wraparound services piece with integrated advocacy and forensics, uh, and the investigation and the prosecutors all working together, you're going to end up with an article like this that say, hey, the form doesn't really make any difference all by itself. So thanks for touching on that. Gail, you want to summarize that legal piece and then we'll move over to the medical? Yes. And did you say we're going to do a two part series or 10 it could parts? Be a 35 part okay. series. Just I just want to know because I'm having fun uh, listening to everyone and kind of going through all this. But to summarize, we're almost at 50. That's our goal. And for those of you who already passed the strangulation law, go back and improve it. We're never done. Victims are counting on us. I would say uh, track your case law. Casey made a good point about unpublished decisions. So we can't let that happen because I'm finding case after case after case of great strangulation decisions that are unfortunately unpublished. Still useful, but it would have a bigger impact if it was published. We're also seeing an increase in judicial training, which is fantastic. But that also means all of you who are listening to this call will need to reach out. Uh, something that happened to me uh, accidentally that now I do intentionally, uh, people would say that judges don't go to training. And I would always ask at one of our trainings who's here. And sure enough, I would find a judge among um, everybody. And uh, this last one in Minnesota, I asked the judge who was there and, he, and I asked him, why are you here? He said, well, I'm the training judge. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know they had training judges. And he goes, it is my job to provide this information to others. So now I intentionally look for the training judge, and I encourage you to look for your training judge in your community. He or she will be your next best friend. So the other thing is implementation plans, multidisciplinary teams. The teams are definitely growing, and we're tracking them. I would say pay attention to those federal sentencing guidelines. They're the best thing that we have right now. Uh, we have come up with a new sentencing brief that we're going to be putting into our resource library. It's something that we did to help a survivor in a situation where no one was taking her case very seriously. And Dr. Bill Smock even jumped in over the weekend to do an affidavit. So thank you again, Bill. And then advocate. Uh, advocate, advocate for a forensic medical exam. I have had the great fortune to meet a lot of forensic nurses. You're going to meet one. Um, on this panel as well, but many of the forensic nurses are perfectly situated to expand their scope of practice to from sexual assault to domestic violence. They're so good at this. And as you can see already, the results are in. Those exams matter. That's a perfect segue to Dr. Bill Smock and Diana Fogno joining us uh, to talk about what we've learned and where we are from a medical perspective. I'm gonna first turn it over to Bill. Uh, as I mentioned, Bill is a police surgeon from Louisville, Kentucky, and oversees their clinical forensic medicine program. Uh, really, without question, one of the leading thinkers in America on this issue of near and non-fatal strangulation assault, as we mentioned earlier, national expert on gunshot wounds, 
uh, and a huge uh, piece of the work that we're doing in all of this with his leadership at the Training Institute. Um, and Diana, of course, uh, amazing forensic nurse examiner uh, with an incredible background that we'll also be sharing today. So Bill, uh, dive us into the medical world. Great. Uh, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Diana. We are so lucky to have you as part of the uh, national program uh, to push that uh, scope of practice of forensic nursing beyond that of the sexual assault nurse examiner to include gunshot wounds, strangulation, DV exams. So, Diana, we owe you a lot. On our website, there are multiple resources for you, including these diagrams that uh, make it simple for a jury to understand the good blood goes up, the bad blood comes down, the location of the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and tracheal rings. All that is available to you, uh, whether you're as testifying as an expert or as a prosecutor. The signs and symptoms, uh, whether adult and pedi uh, pediatric patients, we include those to make sure that you are looking for those just kind of as a checklist. Do I have this here? To have I asked about this? Have I looked behind the ears? Have I looked in the ears? Uh, have I asked all the questions that might be related to the signs and symptoms? And thanks to uh, the staff, we also have them in Spanish, uh, and as well as uh, um, not only Caucasian individuals, but darkly pigmented individuals as well, which makes it um, much more realistic uh, for the patients and our clients that we are taking care of. So, um, Yesenia, thank you very much. We know that strangulation is the application of external pressure to the neck blocks airflow, blood flow, or both. It all depends on how that pressure is applied. And we still have defense attorneys saying, well, you know, they could breathe, so that wasn't strangulation. Now, as Casey says, and Dean, you can breathe all the way until the time your brain ceases to function. So <clears throat> it all depends on how you are assaulted, how that pressure is applied, whether it's only laterally or it's from the front or the front and sides of your neck. So, and That's so where we are. This obviously isn't a medical definition or a legal definition. <laughs> but uh, you, no. were there, you were there uh, when Detective Tim Brown from Gilbert, Arizona, offered his definition in one of the courses last year. And no, and I love, love Tim's definition. You know, strangulation is not normal behavior. It is not self-defense. It is attempted murder by restricting the flow of blood uh, and airflow to the brain. I mean. Your brain cells die, and when we talk about what we're doing or what some programs are doing across the country to address the needs of our victims who have sustained either an anoxic brain injury or a traumatic brain injury, um, the brain is the end organ. Okay, so why do you have everybody do this exercise? Well, one of the reasons that we started doing this now in all of our courses is if you can't yourself define strangulation, you can't write it in a report. And the victim, as uh, Bill can touch on, is not going to say she was strangled. She's going to say, he choked me. Uh, and we've got to translate that physiologically and uh, legally into what it is. It, choking is not the crime. In most of these cases, it's strangulation. She'll call it choking. because that's the, that's the basic norm in the culture to call it choking. Uh, but obviously, we've got to have people practice it. So when she says, he choked me, that detective can translate that in to Bill's definition. I know that the choking in this context, based on what I learned, is actually strangulation. He applied external pressure to her neck that blocked airflow and her blood flow uh, and, and committed the crime of strangulation and assault. Um, so that, that certainly uh, is an important piece. And we're not going to spend much time on this, but we do have a great webinar recorded by Dr. Ralph Yellow. About medical signs and symptoms. Uh, Bill's not going to spend too much time there, uh, but there is a great webinar online that's uh, being watched by many, particularly focused on paramedics and the role of paramedics. And Bill, you really early in your career uh, actually did EMS work uh, directly, and you still roll to the scene when officers are injured for sure. I uh, just want to make a comment about that important piece that we're learning about paramedics. Yes, the paramedics can play a critical role because if they are uneducated, they may triage them out. Oh, yeah, so you were strangled? Well, it's no big deal because there are no visible injuries on your neck. So at least in Louisville and actually in Kentucky, they are, paramedics and EMTs are required to have training in strangulation. And Kentucky and Tennessee are the only two states that mandate that. But it's very important because if our paramedics and our EMTs don't understand the risks of the application of pressure to the neck, 
that you can have internal injuries, carotid dissections, fractures of cartilages or bones in the neck. And if they don't say, you need to be transported because I don't have x-ray vision, I don't have a CT scanner in the back of my truck, you could decline treatment and then stroke or die at some point down the road. And uh, just, uh, as a, just as a reminder, we do have a whole, uh, a whole chapter on paramedic response, EMS response that's available uh, in our online library. And Bill, you want to comment on a few of these resources that we've been uh, creating over the last year or two and have now been updating? Uh, that are yes. Um, because we can't do controlled studies and strangle uh, human beings, we can only rely on other research that's done prior when there weren't uh, IRBs or uh, studies involving fatal hangings to understand the physiologic consequences of what happens to the human body when you deprive the brain of oxygen. So based upon the uh, Red Wing study in 1943-44, Annie Sovanov's work on uh, looking at what happens when you are hung and the anoxic insults to the brain and what happens <clears throat> when you go unconscious, when do you have your anoxic seizure, when do you lose control of your bowel or your bladder, and then when do you take your last breath? Uh, if this question comes up, these studies only involve, at least the Red Wing study only involved men, and the question comes up, well, do you think women would be any different? And I think uh, no. The female brain should respond exactly the same as the male brain. Uh, females may be actually smarter than the men, so, um, but no, there are no controlled studies uh, involving uh, females. The imaging recommendations are uh, being adopted across the world, um, and in one of the recent articles we'll talk about, uh, they just came out in 2019, where a, a level one trauma center recommends <clears throat> using the protocol, uh, as written here, as their triage decision of who needs to be imaged and who doesn't. And so to see that in the annals of emergency medicine uh, is a tremendous um, a boost recommendation to the work that the Institute has done. All the physicians on the committee who came together, looked at the research, and said, if you are strangled and you have these symptoms, then a CTA is indicated so that a carotid dissection is not missed. And I think it's fair to say that in the in the kind of current state of the literature and what we know, Bill, what we're we're somewhere in the neighborhood of a, of a carotid dissection showing up, even in small samples of one out of fifty cases, something like that. Yes, the most recent study that came out using our protocol was uh, from the University of Louisville, where they were finding a carotid dissection in one of every forty-seven strangled uh, patients who met the criteria based upon the uh, our box on the recommendation so that is not insignificant uh, and when i and when i talk to emergency physicians i say what if you think about all the ct scans you order of the head and the brain or the chest or the belly in a trauma patient what is the incidence of a cervical spine fracture or a subdural hematoma or epidural hematoma and it is much less than the one in 47 so they are routinely as standard of care doing CAT scans in trauma patients uh, to make sure they don't miss a subdural or a cervical spine fracture. And the answer is that could be a life-threatening uh, injury, and we don't want to miss it. And this exactly the same is true for a carotid or vertebral artery dissection. We do not want to miss it because the consequences of missing it can be stroke or death. And we have more and more uh, case studies obviously being sent to us, but uh, to just talk briefly about Tanika's case because we continue to use it as an example, particularly with those jurisdictions where doctors are saying, nah, no visible injury, we're not doing a CTA. Uh, it's not indicated if there's not uh, any significant injury. Right. And that's, again, one of the fallacies of strangulation is that you have to have symptoms, neurologic symptoms or external evidence of injury, bruising, abrasion, something on the neck in order to have a carotid dissection. And that is clearly not true. And we use the Tanika case. Our 36-year-old nurse who had a bicep and forearm placed to her neck by her husband. Um, we, she thinks she was rendered unconscious. She finally went to the uh, hospital six days after she was strangled and had bilateral carotid dissections with no marks on her neck. She did have this bruise behind her ear, which was blunt force trauma to the ear, but it was not, um, there was no evidence of external bruising to the neck. 
Fortunately, the emergency physician who saw her understand, understood the risks of strangulation and ordered the CTA, and he had actually written her discharge instructions until he got the call from the radiologist that she had bilateral carotid dissections uh, on CTA. And given the location of her dissections, you're not going to see that on a CTA without contrast. You have to have something to look at the internal part of the vessel, whether an MRA or CTA. Without that, <clears throat> this sort of injury and the risk of stroke or death in Tanika's case um, was high. Um, had this ER doc not done the CTA and really saved Tanika's life. So one of the big issues that's coming up across the country is if hospitals miss it initially or if a victim doesn't get transported and it's a day later, a week later, two weeks later, a month later, um, the question we're getting, as you know, all over the country is should we still be doing a CTA even if it wasn't done uh, right at the time of the incident? Yes, when you look at the literature of when do patients present with strokes or death from CTA, it could be anywhere from a day, a week, a month, or several months post-injury, post-strangulation. And the example that we show here from the um, interventional neuroradiology is three patients who were strangled who had bilateral carotid dissections just like Tanika, and they showed up with their stroke three months, three months, and six months post-assault. And when you get that intimal tear, the clot forms there, and hopefully the clot doesn't break off. But if it does break off, could be, again, a week, a month, six months later, then it's go to the brain, and then you will have uh, a stroke. And the severity of the stroke will be dictated on the size of the clot and how much of your brain uh, is deprived of oxygen. So why do we want to use the CTA as the screening exam? It's easily available. Every emergency department that has a CT scanner in the ER can do a CTA. It is not expensive, and you know, we do get some you know, questions about, well, what about the risk of radiation? I think we're going to talk a little bit about that based upon uh, some of the, the literature. But when <clears throat> any time a physician orders a procedure, it's always what is the benefit of that procedure versus the risk of that procedure. And if we're seeing CT or carotid dissections or vertebral artery dissections in 1 in 47 patients, that is very high. And what is the potential risk? Well, it may be cancer, you know, 15 years down the road. But what is that risk when we look at the literature and we we have a slide on, on an upcoming article? It's basically 1 in 13,000. So if you're looking at just by the numbers, 1 in 47 ver <clears throat> versus 1 in 13,000, I'm going to go with 1 in 47 as that is the, the risk um, uh, or, and the benefit of doing a CTA uh, if they meet the criteria that we have published in the guidelines. That's great. Uh, so we have a couple resources online for you. Uh, Bill did a four-minute video that's available in our resource library and is on our YouTube channel um, about carotid dissection and the significance of these radiographic imaging guidelines and the importance of them. And it's certainly a video that uh, if you're a, if you're a police officer, a prosecutor, an advocate, and you're advocating on behalf of the survivor with a medical professional, with a doctor in particular, or your forensic nurse trying to get your doctors to pay attention, this is a great resource for you. Gail also did a short video that's on our YouTube channel and in our, accessible through our resource library about the CTA, uh, and it's a little video she just made, uh, which I think is a great uh, little way to uh, tell the story and uh, obviously, Bill, that list of those adopting it, even though others are fighting it and uh, we're kind of in that battle across America and around the world, your list is growing and growing of people who clearly are saying, you know what, we're going to do the CTA uh, because the potential liability of not doing the CTA uh, runs into the millions and millions of dollars. All right. These are some forensic nurses from Ohio and their hospitals have adopted it uh... It's wonderful to see these hospitals. You know, the um, Department of Health in New York, uh, Howard Zucker, their commissioner, uh, sent this letter to every physician in the state of New York talking about the risk of non-fatal strangulation and the need to do a CTA. That is, this is a powerful document. And when you are looking at uh, 
how do I convince my physicians the need? You can provide not only what we have online is the Dear Doctor letter that includes the Taniki case, but also the letter from the Department of Health in New York recommending that you do some study to evaluate the vessels in the neck, whether it's a CTA or an MRA. Look at those vessels. And uh, our San Diego County hospitals and facilities have gone down the same road, uh, adopting that, and we really appreciated the leadership of Tracy Pryor in the DA's office and Michelle Shores with Palomar Health uh, and a lot of uh, passionate folks who have uh, made this happen uh, as well uh, for us there. And you want to just briefly touch on Australia? Yes, we, uh, Gail and I presented the same information in Australia, and the day after we presented it, the radiologist down in Canberra sent a uh, letter out to every radiologist across the state of Canberra that we will be doing CTAs on our strangled victims. This is a photograph uh, of the radiologist and his fellow who uh, came to the conference and uh, one of our superstars down in uh, Australia who uh, is pushing this uh, and educating other emergency physicians and forensic physicians and radiologists uh, to do this study to save the victim's life so they don't uh, they don't stroke. And you know, our positive finding is extremely rare. Well, for the CTA, it's one in 47, but we're also finding that there are other injuries besides carotid or vertebral dissections, fractured hyoid bones, fractured larynx. Uh, so this is a screening uh, exam. And this uh, from Audrey, uh, where we're finding dissections. In that case, the instance it was uh, 0.5%, but the other, the fractures, the edema, the herniated disc, and other soft tissue trauma from the application of pressure. You have to do something to look internally to make sure that there are no injuries because that's very important as for the patient's follow-up and their, their safety and morbidity. And we'd love you to talk briefly, and you have been dealing with this all over America, including uh, in, in Kentucky and in uh, Indiana, but we'd love you to talk briefly about, you know, all of our work in this is obviously bumping up against the use of the carotid restraint and the lateral vascular neck restraint by law enforcement, uh, both with criminal suspects and, and even in their own training to each other. Uh, that's certainly been a hot issue in 2019. Uh, what uh, I've got three cases of law enforcement officers who stroked during lateral vascular neck restraint training. What happened in those cases was that plaque of their, from their internal carotid arteries broke off, went to the brain, and they had a stroke. And the older we get, the more plaque we will have normally in our arteries. And so pressure to the neck can also cause a stroke from, uh, we call that an embolic stroke, where pieces will break off. And I think most of the major law enforcement agencies across the country are no longer using the lateral vascular neck restraint except in lethal force encounters. And it is clearly deadly force. It's deadly force whether it's supplied by a partner, it's deadly force if somebody applies it to a police officer, or an officer applies it to someone else. It's a, for law enforcement, it's a great tool if you're in a deadly force encounter. Otherwise, you know, we, don't, we should not be shooting people for uh, resistance. It ha we have to be able to articulate the need to use deadly force. Uh, so, and what happened in Fort Wayne is the uh, chief made the decision to suspend training officers in the lateral vascular neck restraint because of the risk to officers and officer safety. That's great. Well, we're going to be talking a lot more about that. Talk about this Vegas case, because obviously the, the message we're sending out is uh, you do this CTA, you can save a life. It's just that simple. It, it is that simple. And if we don't do it, we're going to miss it. And this case that we got from Las Vegas is that, you know, she had – uh, loss of, she didn't know whether she had loss of conscience. She didn't know, but she did have pressure to the neck. And so the forensic nurse in Vegas got her to the hospital. They did the CTA, and she had an inclusion of her right internal carotid with you know no visible external injury. So, again, you have to convince the physician. It's really educating the physician that you do not have to have neurologic symptoms or external bruising to the neck in order to have an underlying injury to a vessel. And this is obviously another piece, this tracheal perforation uh, that, that we have been talking about in 2019. You want to just touch on that? Yeah. Uh, again, you know, besides the, the vessels, there are other structures that can kill you, the trachea, the hyoid bone, you know, hematomas within the neck. 
we need to do this test to make sure that the patient is safe to go home. Uh, and strokes, uh, we know that if we have that tear and it's unrecognized and that clot breaks off, you know, we anticipate that our victims will have strokes. And you know, the, this is an injury that should not be missed. It doesn't have to be missed as long as they go to the hospital and the physicians or the advanced practitioners do the CTA. So we want you to be telling us about your cases. We're certainly gathering them, as uh, Bill has been touching on, from around the country. If you have a case of a dissection or a stroke or a fractured hyoid bone, um, we, we want to hear, hear about those cases. We're looking for cases to do case studies on so that we can continue to gather this data in the absence, absence of a large clinical trial, which we're probably never going to get, certainly uh, not, not in, the, in real time. We've got to do, uh, we've got to have case studies. And I don't know if you want to comment on it, but it seems like the more we talk about it, the more we train, the more case studies we're getting. Well, I'll add oh, we, if you go yeah. to, and the whole point for our friends who are listening in, what we're gathering is the cases that are unpublished, but take a look at the next slide, accidentally is now going to turn into an intentional research project. We are now starting to collect cases where we see the fractured fibroid cartilage, a case from 2014 in Washington, and this year alone, I found a case where the woman had a, a stroke and she ended up dying 10 days after she was strangled. So initially I was kind of focused on looking on published cases, published research, published case studies, and we had to just find it uh, from the medical community, but prosecutors who are listening to this, you may have been working on a case where your victim had a significant injury, and please uh, let us know about that as well. All of these things will help move the field into a real positive direction. And Bill, how often are you now hearing from people, or, and we're, they're telling us about these cases? Oh, we're getting uh, one a week, and for the clinicians on the line and the nurses, how many victims who come into the ER with a stroke are we asking, were you strangled before? We're not. It's not part of the current stroke evaluation. And we should be. If I see someone, a woman who's less than the age of 45 and she comes in with a stroke, you know, it's a dissection until proven otherwise. We have to ask, was pressure applied to your neck? There are some recent articles that have come out. Uh, Dr. Green and I spent an hour uh, talking with the, the primary author, Dr. Heimer, of this about CT or using MR uh, for the evaluation of non-fatal strangulation. Uh, what they found was that certainly... Uh, in this study, and it was, the way it was designed, you basically self-selected to get an MR. It wasn't somebody in the ER saying you're going to get this one or you're not. Uh, the author also advised that you know he recognized that the plain MR, um, I basically MRI, is not as sensitive as the MRA because we need some contrast in the vessel to show the outline of the vessel, looking for that dissection. But what was positive about this article, and I thought, was that 43% of those who underwent MRI had positive findings, whether that's a hemorrhagic lymph node, swelling of the platysma muscle, things that we wouldn't see externally, but there is definitely evidence of injury internally that is not visible externally. So when it comes to MR and MRA of the neck, it is really the best test for finding non-visible soft tissue injuries. Uh, another study, this is the one um, out of Louisville, and this is the one using our protocol. And some of the positive things are the found evidence of vascular injuries, basically two, uh, the carotid dissections, and the instance was one out of 47, which is a little above 2%. But they also found other sorts of you know injuries, the, the fractures, the soft tissue swelling. and uh, from this article, what was interesting is they used uh, board-certified radiologists, but unfortunately not forensic radiologists. There is a subspecialty of radiology where if you have additional training in forensics, articles have shown the sensitivity of finding uh, very subtle findings is better for the forensic radiologist uh, versus the hands of the uh, regular radiologist. So um, this is the one in 47 which is what we want to recommend. Other articles out of, this is the one out of uh, Indianapolis. 
Uh, and what I think the biggest thing out of this article is on the second page, they say follow the protocol uh, that is recommended by the uh, National Advisory Committee. Uh, other findings were the entry the forensic nurse documents, and they put it in writing, much better than the ER attending or the ER resident, which is why you want forensic nurses doing these uh, sorts of exams. And that finding, obviously, as you have been saying, patients with a carotid dissection who had no visible injury, which is it appears to be relatively common. Yes, and in this case, the victims that had the dissections had uh, neck pain and difficulty swallowing, but nothing externally. So again, don't let somebody tell you that you need to have external findings. Um, the other things that we're you know we're looking at are. How do we address the needs post-discharge of those individuals that have um, injuries, uh, maybe subtle uh, brain injuries? Uh, and Michelle Patch has done some great work there. And that's actually a 2018 article, not a 2008 article, yeah. but certainly a fresh one and an important one. Yeah. And so more CTA. This is – we get pushback. What about the risk of cancer? Uh, this is the article uh, where they looked at the actual risk of thyroid cancer, and it's one in 13,699. Um, so go to the risk benefit. You know, one in 47 will have a vascular injury. So we want the emergency physicians that see these patients or uh, office physicians to think of the CTA as a screening tool, just like the ER doc thinks of scanning the head and the neck routinely for trauma patients should also be the, the standard of care. So this is kind of where we are. I know we're running short of time, but when it comes to, if you get pushback, the risk of radiation is minimal compared to the potential risk of having a dissection. And that's where we need to go. We want to do no harm. We want to you know, treat the patients uh, with the, well, the knowledge that we know. And my feeling is that given their current state of knowledge and the associated morbidity and mortality associated with a missed arterial injury, it is malpractice not to order that screening CTA. And what is the defense? If you see a patient who's been strangled, you say, oh, you look fine, sweetheart, you send them out, and they come back later with a stroke or they die, and you miss that crowded dissection, you have no defense. The information is there. Good. Well, uh, that's great. Thank you. Can you just briefly touch, too, before we turn it over to Diana, can you briefly touch a little bit on the Medical Advisory Committee work of the Training Institute? Yes. We are so fortunate to have people that are volunteering their time from, um, you know, physicians, sane nurses, you know, the, the Jackie Campbells, the Ruth Downings, Diana, uh, Michelle Shores. I mean, we've got people, for, um, you know, physicians, Mike Weaver, Ralph, Bill Green, that are doing uh, the great work on, on a volunteer basis that are donating their time to push the the envelope, the knowledge that we uh, that we have out there, these case studies together, to make sure that when our victims show up and we treat them, we give them the latest and greatest information about what can happen to them, and then the best way to take care of them. We're doing. Um, database of our pediatric strangulation as well as our other strangulation. We're updating those, and we should have a Excel spreadsheet of all everything that we can find regarding uh, strangulation, both adult and pediatric, in a database for you. Probably 400 articles. Yes, we've got, it'll be 400 plus. Uh, we have the pregnancy protocol from Mike Weaver and Barb uh, Bachmeyer, who put that together. Um, as well as Dr. Weaver and Sally, um, you know, Mike and I have done a webinar on the radiographic evaluation of strangled patients. That is a resource for you. That's great. So lots Thank of you. stuff. I know there's a lot going on with the medical advisory committee that we don't have time to talk about, but thanks for just uh, highlighting that uh, for us briefly. And uh, we're very honored to have Diana Fogno along with Bill also joining us today. Uh, Diana's going to talk about a little bit about pediatric strangulation, but Diana, thank you for all the work you've been doing, the work you're doing in uh, really starting and developing the Academy uh, of Forensic Nursing and focusing on domestic violence and strangulation beyond uh, all the work you've done in sexual assault. Well, thank you, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be here today. 
Um, we're going to go um, as fast as I can through these slides. I know time is an issue, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the pediatric subcommittee members. Um, you know, we started this project a couple years ago, and you can see here the list of members. Um, we've had some um, barriers with this um, just due to the fact that uh, we were lacking in a child abuse um, pediatrician on this committee. So hopefully we can pick that back up again with Dr. Katie Schneider um, to um, look at what the guidelines should be for pediatric strangulation, because there is not a consensus of agreement on this. So um, you can see that we did a webinar here last year, Dr. Baldwin, who leads the group, uh, my good friend uh, Val Sievers out of Colorado, uh, Katie Schneider uh, was out of Denver as well at that time, and myself. Key points that we covered uh, were the differences uh, specifically in the anatomy for children versus adult, their narrow uh, larynx, windpipe, challenges that we would have with the children, and probably the biggest one is the uh, consensus on surveying or doing the imaging um, on children. What imaging should be done? There's not enough research yet. The Institute survey, the current practice practices, and this was all over the road on this. Gail, could you just talk about this for a second? I sure can. Um, you know, obviously, we're in the quest of asking a lot of questions, trying to get answers. So we did a survey on one of our webinars using a poll feature just to find out where people were. I can't remember exactly how many people we had, but I thought we had close to 300. And as you can see here, the folks who responded were all over the place on whether or not they would even order imaging if a child had visible injury, signs, or symptoms of strangulation. CTA was 25% and no imaging was 28% and then everything in the middle. So the, I'm really proud of the pediatric committee because you're trying to do something that no one has really done before to try to think this through. The second question we asked, well, this is what they did with visible injuries. What are they gonna do if you know about the strangulation history but there's no visible injuries, no signs or symptoms. As you can see here, most of them, 64%, did no imaging altogether, which now what we know is that you can have a carotid dissection without any visible injury whatsoever. And the only way to determine some of these very life-threatening internal injuries is an imaging. You can see why we're very passionate and feeling a sense of urgency to really get this information out to folks and do more research. But I think the heart of it, as Dr. Kosmok said, is do no harm and find all injuries. That's our motto. Mm -hmm. Diana, you want to talk a little bit about this new article? Yeah, um, I read through this article and this is uh, the MRI um, identified conventional arterial spin label perfusion imaging. Of course, those are big words and I don't understand all of it, but the gist of this is the two cases discussed in here, these are clearly children and this is child abuse. So what it speaks to is that the pediatric radiologists recognized that there was more than just a subdural bleed in the heads of these children and um, came right out and said, that the perfusion, and I imagine that was petechiae on the brain was related to strangulation. Both of the children in this article did have other injuries. So again, it speaks to that head to toe with children. You gotta look all over because the potential for other injuries is great. Well, thanks for representing Kathy and Katie and our all the folks, Todd Flossie and others, really thinking through this pediatric piece. We don't have a lot of time to touch on it, but it certainly is a developing area and an important area. And Bill, if you just want, before we talk about traumatic brain injury, if you just want to make a comment or two about this issue of the reluctance of medical professionals to do imaging with kids. Yes, the, there's always been the risk of we do not want to induce you know, cancers in children. And 
Nobody wants that. Uh, some institutions, actually our uh, pediatric hospital here, if you are uh, 15 and above, you get a CTA. If you're below the age of 15, you will get an MRA. So uh, although other hospitals have different protocols, we know some hospitals at age three, they're getting CTAs. Uh, so there are pluses and minuses uh, to all tests. Uh, if you do an MRI, you have to sedate them because they have to hold still for you know, 20, 30 minutes or so. But the importance is uh, just to recognize that you can have injuries. We don't have a good handle of what is the real instance in the pediatric patient because we haven't been doing these studies for so long. But just know that you can have injury without external evidence of trauma. And then let's spend a little bit of time on traumatic brain injury because obviously this is going to be a huge focus for us going forward. Yes, since the brain is the end organ, and we know that when victims are assaulted in DV cases, they can have their head banged against the wall, which can create a concussion. They can be shaken, and so their brain is going sloshing back and forth within the confines of the skull with no trauma, but they're having shearing on a cellular level where axons are being sheared. And then you can also have the possibility of an anoxic or hypoxic uh, insult. And so the uh, Institute has created this uh, committee on uh, traumatic brain injury because this is the primary long-term consequence of what we're seeing. And uh, actually just last week, uh, Bill Lamadusky, uh, Michelle Shores, uh, and their medical director actually went down to Barrow Neurologic Institute in uh, Phoenix to talk with them about what they're doing, and they're doing some groundbreaking work. We met with Ashley, Ashley Bridwell, who is the social worker down there, who actually came up with this program. They're actually putting physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists out in these their five domestic violence shelters in Phoenix. And they are training the people there to screen for this. They're meeting with the survivors. They're training and educating these survivors on how to cope with the traumatic brain injury. And what was interesting, I asked, how do you differentiate an anoxic brain injury versus a traumatic brain injury? And the, uh, one of the physical therapists said, well, with traumatic brain injury, I know that because their head was hit here, and this is what we're going to work on. But what was shocking, she said, when I, I know when I'm dealing with an anoxic brain injury, it's because their brain is like Swiss cheese. The areas of the brain that have actually died or have been impaired. So going forward, this is where I think there's groundbreaking research. We need to actually look at this. We need to develop protocols. What is the best way to screen these individuals for these long-term consequences of memory or executive function related to a, either a traumatic brain injury and anoxic brain injury? Because if our victims survive, but then they don't function because they can't remember how to get to the doctors, they can't remember their children's names. We have to help them, one, be diagnosed, and then how do they undergo treatment, and where do they go for treatment? And that's kind of a problem across the country, is that after your patient's been discharged, you may tell them to follow up with their primary care provider, but are we telling them they need to follow up with a neurologist who has specialized training in TBIs? And that is the ideal place for them to go, but it may take many steps to get there. And many may fall through the cracks if they have, don't have a primary care physician who is going to see these people, who is going to direct them into therapy or the appropriate testing, the cognitive testing, or the special MRI testing will show that they actually have a traumatic brain injury or an injury of some sort. So we're looking at that. That's more to come. You want to just comment on the, the acute concussion evaluation tool that we've looked at? Yes, we've looked at uh, several um, tools, and there really isn't one out there. There are several that look at. There's the helps, and they look at concussions, but there's nothing that really combines the, the two, the brain injury from strangulation as well as uh, concussion. And so there, there can be many. There can be the concussion, hypoxic, anoxic. And so that's our challenge is can we create a, a tool to screen that would cover all the potential brain injuries associated with strangulation, and it doesn't exist yet. Well, and obviously one of the biggest issues is this is a volume issue that has been totally missed as far as assessment, examination, treatment. 
uh, with survivors? Yes. I mean, we, we, when we look at the number of DV cases across the country, and clearly there are way, 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 way more women with TBI than NFL football players. Uh, but where is all the money coming from? It's you know, from the the NFL. Uh, they know that there's a problem. They know that their uh, players can have long-term and life-changing consequences. Uh, but who is helping these women uh, who may have similar or worse injuries? And you touched on your visit to Barrow, but what's the probably biggest takeaway from that visit? Uh, the takeaway is that we need to do more. Um, the model at Barrow is putting these occupational therapists actually out into the um, domestic violence centers, the five that they have in in Phoenix. There are therapists there twice a month, and they created a program called the, the Brain Club, which is to help these victims overcome injuries um, from their brain injury. And it's incredible to give these women hope that they now understand why they can't remember certain things. So how do we help them organize their lives? And they have the Institute gives them a actual backpack with organizers in there. And it, it's tremendous. And so the work of, of Ashley Bridwell there and the Barrow Institute, uh, I can't say enough good things. Uh, and they are leading the way and we need to, to learn from what they're doing. So I'm gonna interject here. Uh, we are wrapping up part two of our What We Have Learned in 2019. And uh, it turns out there's gonna be a part three. Uh, but uh, we, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just wrapping up uh, this piece with Bill. And then uh, we will wrap up part two and take your questions and answers. So if you want to send in uh, some questions or comments, we're certainly happy to take them and we'll be uh, responding to those live uh, momentarily here for the last 20 to 30 minutes of uh, part two here. But I do, uh, Bill, just want you to touch on, obviously there is some research coming out and it's pointing out a number of these issues. One is that uh, service providers don't actually understand this either. And they don't actually, you know, what they might think is PTSD is actually a brain injury. Uh, but Absolutely. They don't have the knowledge either. No, they don't. They don't. And I think we're doing our uh, patients a disservice, our victims a disservice. Uh, when they come to the ER, yeah, there's nothing life-threatening, but that doesn't mean that their brain hasn't sustained an injury. And that it, uh, where do they go? And I say, you know, the, clearly, the vast majority of uh, individuals with brain injuries from DV situations are not getting the help they need. When we meet with our survivor groups and 13 out of 13 say that they all have trouble with memory, where is that coming from? What part of their brain has been damaged? Um, and, and it's there. And are we, are the prosecutors addressing that in restitution as part of the, uh, whether that's criminally or civilly, are we saying, okay, now we know you have a, a traumatic brain injury, but what are we doing to help you get over that for the rest of your life? Because this can be a permanent um, an injury that they're going to have to deal with and how do they overcome those obstacles. And this is just a reiteration of the volume issue. The Ohio uh, State University and Ohio Domestic Violence Network, Rachel Ramirez, Ruth Downing and many others have been kind of looking at this and their sample is relatively small, but it's pointing a very large number, perhaps as many as 80 percent uh, or more of domestic violence victims who have experienced at least a mild uh, traumatic brain injury. So as Bill mentioned, uh, this is a massive volume issue. It's certainly an issue we're going to be addressing uh, in looking at forensic medical exams for domestic violence and strangulation assault survivors. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight uh, that number. And then, Bill, you want to just quickly talk about some of the articles that are coming out about this? Yeah, these are some of the best that we have we have found. The uh, And what the kind of the bottom line is, is these are very subtle findings. Uh, and it may only be that you know, the doctor that sees you is going to have no idea what your baseline is. It's going to be your family that says, Mom, why can't you remember this? Or I told you that an hour ago, but now you can't remember. And so th these are subtle findings, and the cognitive testing is really the only way that you're going to find out. The CT is going to be normal. A regular MRI will be normal. There are special MRIs because called the fusion weighted MRIs that are doing on the football players looking for CTE. 
but it is out there. And it, and just because you have a normal CT or MRI does not mean that you do not have a brain injury because uh, the injury is on a cellular level, not something that you can see on MRI or CT. So these are some of the resources that are out there. Uh, kind of, we've kind of, this is our, our best uh, of the best of uh, TBI articles. So if you want to learn more, um, go to this list, download them, and you will understand the epi it's really an epidemic of TBI in victims of uh, DV. And I would like to add something that this is one area that I certainly was unaware of, especially to the extent, and it certainly explains a lot. Uh, over the years since we started the Strangulation Institute, victim after victim after victim, they continued to call us for help in navigating the, the medical system. Now, the, uh, many years ago, they would refer to, I think, our traumatic brain injury victim as it's all in your head uh, because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. And now, as you kind of said before in our training, it is all in their head and we need to understand this. So one of the things we wanted to do is our, our committee is definitely pulling together all of the articles to make it easy for you to read, just like we learned about strangulation. The first professional that really needs to know about traumatic brain injury is us. And one of the things that startled me as I started to learn about the symptoms of, a, of an anoxic brain injury or traumatic brain injury or even PTSD, they're all the same. So it makes you wonder how many cases, how many victims have been diagnosed with PTSD when in fact it could be um, traumatic brain injury. And in the research that I'm reading as well, the other thing it says, in order for victims to have a better outcome, we really need to move fast. So right now, we don't have universal screening for victims. We don't have victims being assessed. If they're not being assessed or diagnosed, they're certainly not being treated. But everything I've read says move fast in trying to get the treatment, the, the right treatment that victims need suffering from a traumatic brain injury. Thanks, Gail. Well, I'm going to call time on part two. <laughs> we had a goal of doing this uh, in two webinars. Uh, now I have a new goal. This is called re -goaling. And we're going to set a goal of uh, doing this in three parts. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up part two. If you'd like to uh, send in questions to us, uh, please do so at this time. We will look forward to uh, reading those and dialoguing on them with our team. Uh, before we wrap up uh, part two. And uh, just as a kind of a closing shout out, uh, we do want to acknowledge that at our big Family Justice Center conference coming up in May uh, in San Diego, uh, we will have a whole track on near and non-fatal strangulation assault along with our other tracks on trauma-informed Hope Center work, on our Camp Hope America program, on our Family Justice Center work, uh, and so many other areas of advocacy, investigation, and prosecution. So uh, there are lots of resources. Our conference in May, uh, which is filling up fast, is a great opportunity uh, to really come with a team and think through a lot of the things around domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, and strangulation uh, that we have been talking about here. So we're happy to answer questions as we wrap up part two, and we'll look forward to uh, providing part three, and then uh, we uh, hope and pray that part three will wrap up uh, what we learned in 2019. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Gail Strack, and I just want to thank all of the attendees who just joined us for part two of what we have learned in our webinar related to strangulation in 2019. I just got to say that it was a lot of work putting together this PowerPoint and I just want to thank Casey, Bill, Diana, Dan for joining us today and all of you in particular who have joined us because this particular webinar is really geared for people who have attended our trainings before. So that means you have a commitment to continue to learn, to continue to improve our response to strangulation cases. And I just want to give you a big, big hug. We've received some questions. Let me just make sure that I can hear uh, Dr. Bill Smock's voice. Uh, 
Bill, are you on the on the line? Caller? I am on, on the air? I am on the line. I'm here. Fantastic. Well, it looks like we have received some questions. The questions are both legal and medical. I will go ahead and answer a couple of the legal ones. I want to thank the people who are on the call who are still pushing the envelope and trying to pass new laws. I really like the Maryland a law that was passed really focusing on doing some screening, not only with law enforcement, but the medical community. So good for you. I also agree with the comment about the exclusion of forensic nurses in many different practice guides. And I just want to share for all the forensic nurses, emergency nurses, uh, physicians assistants, we are your biggest fans. We think you are doing amazing work and we're constantly singing your praises and trying to recruit even more nurses to this work. You play a very important and valuable role as we continue to push the envelope for domestic violence strangulation exams, the CTAs, uh, getting you to testify as experts in our criminal cases. So thank you, thank you, thank you for what you are doing. And also a shout out to all the law enforcement officers because you're the first responders and what you do really matters and will control the entire case from beginning to end. So uh, last point I wanna make with respect to medical mandated reporting, I realized I misspoke. I gave the wrong state credit for something that they didn't do when I should have been giving Oklahoma credit for adding the word strangulation into their medical mandated reporting statutes. Because I do think that's extremely important for those of you who may not know, uh, we've had medical mandated reporting statutes in our laws for probably before I was born, and that's a long time ago. What hasn't happened is that we haven't updated many of our statutes to include strangulation, because strangulation laws have just recently started to pass in the last probably 15, 16 years. So congratulations to Oklahoma for being the first state I will be starting my law school class in the summer and I will be assigning this homework assignment to the students so we can uh, see if any other states have included strangulation in their medical mandated reporting. But uh, now switching over to medical, I would say, Bill, you did a fantastic job doing a, a nice overview of all the updates related to medical. I think our number one issue and what's been coming up here as well definitely comes back to the CTA. Uh, all kinds of questions. Uh, our, our attendees are definitely struggling with still trying to convince people to do the CTA. They're struggling to convince victims to stick around long enough to do the CTA. They are struggling with getting follow-up assessments with victims who have uh, received a CTA and maybe have no positive finding. We also know that some recent articles came out. And since we just received yet another phone call from the media, but this one related to the CTA, I'm going to ask you to let's go back and talk about the most recent CTA, CTA article out of Kentucky. I think both of us have read that more than once. There are some good things out of that article, and there are some things that we both consider uh, very troubling. So I'm just gonna leave it up to you on how you wanna just address CTA in general, because I know this is a common question you get by phone, by email, and at our trainings. Absolutely happy to do that. Yeah, this was an article that came out of the University of Loyola Hospital where they retrospectively reviewed CTAs in victims who had been strangled. The good news, the encouraging news is that when they looked at the frequency of carotid dissections, and I think this is the, the takeaway, is that they were finding carotid dissections in a little more than 2% of the victims who were strangled. And when you actually look at their numbers, it was one carotid dissection for every 47 victims who underwent the CTA. So one in 47, which is a little more than 2%. That is critical. That says the reason that we want to do the CTA is we do not want to discharge that one in 47 patient from the ER without the CTA to go home and stroke or die. So that is the good news. One in 47, that is the incidence of vascular injury. 
And what's also very interesting in that article is they also found other uh, injuries, soft tissue hemorrhage, lymph, lymph node hemorrhages. And the benefit of doing the CTA is that not only it can uh, tell the treating physician that the victim has no carotid or vertebral artery injury, therefore they are safe to go home, they are, are not at risk of stroking and dying, but it also gives them information about is the laryngeal cartilage fractured, is the hyoid bone fractured, is there a soft tissue hematoma uh, within the neck. So it is clearly the best test out there, the most rapid test out there to uh, evaluate and reassure the patient and the physician or the advanced nurse pra uh, practitioner that the patient is safe to be discharged. Now, we keep getting you know, some pushback from uh, physicians that haven't really read the article or um, know the risks of radiation, because one of the major push pushbacks is, well, I don't want to give this patient thyroid cancer. So we actually looked at articles, and I found one that said the risk of thyroid cancer from a single CTA is one in 13,565. So it is extremely rare. And any medical test, it's benefits versus risk. That's true with any drug, any medical test. So if the, the risk of having a carotid dissection is one in 47 versus the risk 10 to 15 years from now, one in 13,000 plus of having a, a thyroid tumor, which is clearly treatable, once that stroke happens, uh, we can't take that back. That is going to be a <clears throat> disability, and may the patient may even die. And then who is going to take care of that patient for the rest of her life or his life uh, because they can't move half their body or they can't speak? So that's why we are so uh, supportive <clears throat> of educating physicians on the need to do the CTA because, in, in my opinion, it really is malpractice to discharge that patient without the CTA if they've met one of the symptoms that are on the radiologic imaging guidelines. And, and those guidelines are based upon the medical literature. Okay, Bill. Well, thank you very much. And just for everyone's FYI, just to make sure we're all talking about the same article. Right now, Dr. Bill Smock is talking about the CTA of the neck and strangulation victims. It's an article that came out of Kentucky in 2019, and it was the findings at a level one trauma center over a seven year period. Uh, that's the article that we were referring to. So we believe that even though they came up with a different conclusion than we would have, uh, we still believe that the overwhelming research that's out there, the case studies that are out there support doing the CTA. And what's interesting, I just received an email from Tanika. As many of you know, Tanika was one of our case studies when nine uh, highly qualified forensic physicians in the country all came together to review the existing research to come up with expert consensus. They carefully evaluated Tanika's case. And if we were to follow the recommendations from the Kentucky article that I'm just gonna to refer to the Kentucky article, Tanika would be dead right now. And one of the things I certainly picked out of the Kentucky article and other articles is that traditionally this has not been a focus that generally bad outcomes have happened to victims, especially when you wait too long. And many times in the some of the homework that you gave me, Bill, I found that the carotid dissections were found almost accidentally when they were doing imaging for other injuries that the victims had. And then, oops, look what we found. And everything I've read that if you miss a carotid dissection, that the outcomes are very devastating to include death, and or long-term uh, stroke consequences that are permanent. So uh, thank you so much, Bill, for leading this way. There's a couple of other questions with the few minutes that we have today, because we did go to one and a half hours. So we're thinking maybe about 15 to 20 minutes to answer some of the questions. So one of the questions um, you might want to answer, because uh, Diana Fogno 
is not able to continue to be on the Q&A, but they were asking about SANE nurses and certification for domestic violence exams. I know right now at the Academy of Forensic Nursing, they are working, have, uh, working diligently to come up with a certification program. And in fact, I can announce now in our October four day course, we're gonna have a special one day course for forensic nurses where they're going to be talking about the key components of a domestic violence strangulation exam. Bill, is there anything you wanna to add to that domestic violence strangulation exam since you and your group have been doing it for a long time? Uh, no, I think this is the way forward. We know from the literature, we know from Maricopa, we know from San Diego, that when you use a forensic nurse to do the forensic evaluation of a victim who's been strangled, the prosecution rate and actually conviction rate in San Diego we're seeing is greater than 95%. So what prosecutor in the country would um, not want to have a 95% conviction rate, that's misdemeanors and felonies, when it comes to strangulation assaults? So that, that is key. And the use of forensic nurses that are appropriately trained is the answer to address this need across the world. And I really got to hand it to the Academy of Forensic Nursing for taking the lead to come up with a curriculum that will give a forensic nurse the knowledge, information uh, to be the expert on the stand, to do the exam, and then to be able to uh, testify to their findings and the importance, particularly the importance of recognizing those signs and symptoms and what they mean to the, to the victim and then also to the criminal process. Okay, well, we have two more questions. I'll take the next one. The, uh, the question is, do you have a special training to become a domestic violence expert? And the answer is yes. Last year, we launched for the very first time a one-day course on expert witnesses in strangulation cases. And we did include advocates, police officers, medical uh, professionals to participate in that one-day training. What we learned very quickly, that one day was not enough but we did limit that particular training to people who have already attended the four-day course. We will be doing another expert course this year. We haven't identified that date, but I would say please join our mailing list if you haven't already. We will be constantly sharing that information with others and posting it on our website. So Bill, I'm gonna give you the last question. It's a new question, and I think it, it's a good question. It has to do with suffocation. So this has come up before, but could you summarize when it comes to a victim who has been suffocated, whether it's fatal or non-fatal, what type of internal or external injuries are you looking for? Well, uh, that is a great question because you can be fatally suffocated and have no visible injury. It all depends upon the method of suffocation. Where we want to look is if suffocation is the restriction of the ability to breathe. The most common form is by pressure to, over the nose and mouth. So we're going to looking for nasal trauma. We want to look for intraoral trauma. We want to pull down their lips, look for any sort of impressions, indentations uh, of the uh, teeth on the inner aspect of the lip. We want to look for lacerations where maybe there was enough force on the teeth to lacerate the interior aspects uh, of the uh, the lips, either upper or lower. And then uh, when it comes to positional asphyxia, which would be suffocation where somebody's sitting on your chest or abdomen and you can't breathe, you're going to look, be looking for uh, contusions or abrasions or something over the chest and abdomen, which again gets back to why we want forensic nurses to do a head-to-toe clinical assessment that a police officer can't do. They need to be examined head-to-toe because if you don't examine the inside of the mouth, their chest, their abdomen, you may be missing potential injuries, which would give evidence to the history that they're providing. So Bill, what about internal injuries of suffocation? I mean, I mean, at the heart of it, you got hypoxia, you have difficulty breathing. Could there be any damage to the lungs? There could be congestion within the lungs. It all depends upon how that pressure is applied. You may see fluid build up in the lungs. You may see Petechial hemorrhages within the lungs, it, it, again, all based on how that pressure is applied, but you may have nothing. So what kind of uh, imaging would you recommend? 
Well, uh, again, it's going to be based upon the history. If the history was he put a pillow over my nose and mouth and I couldn't breathe and then I blacked out, uh, you may need no imaging. But then you have to think, what are the long-term consequences? This may be somebody who sustained some hypoxic brain injury and will, may need a diffusion-weighted MRI down the road to look and see, is there any anoxic or hypoxic insults to the, to the brain? So each one is going to be based upon uh, the history. But suffocation alone, I'm not sure there's any imaging that's going to show whether a victim was suffocated or not. Okay. It's going to be more physical exam. Well, I think we have reached the end of our time. So I'm going to thank you, Dan, uh, Diana, and Casey for helping us today with part two. We have one more uh, webinar to kind of wrap up 2019. Do we have that date? It'll be March 9th. So please join us. And if you have any final questions, just go ahead and type them in in the comments or during the evaluation process. We'd love to get your feedback. Again, thank you all for joining us and all the work that you do. I just want to give you a big, big hug on behalf of all of us. I've got Carly and Trish with me today, and they did a fantastic job of managing all of the technology, which gives me, quite frankly, like a heart attack. I can always feel myself, uh, my heart beating a lot faster during these courses, but I'm glad it went well without any problems. So uh, see you in March. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Bye, Bell. Bye-bye.